Welcome. My name is Maya Allison. I'm the um, founding director of the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery and the chief curator at NYU Abu Dhabi. And I'm delighted to have my uh, colleagues and peers here with me. I have uh, Lynn Gumpert, the director of the Gray Art Gallery, which is New York University's Fine Art Museum in New York. And Melissa Ratcliffe, a professor at the Steinhardt School, who was the curator of Inventing Downtown, um, the product of an incredible amount of research. Um, so as we go through this conversation, um, we can see you in the Q&A box. If you want to type in questions or comments at any point, please feel free and we'll respond as we go. Um, but mostly we'll address your questions towards the end at about um, 8.45, 8.50 or so. We'll turn to uh, questions and discussion with the audience. Um, and what we'll do tonight is Melissa is going to give a short presentation about the history of the exhibition because she's done an incredible amount of research that led to this. We'll talk about the process of the, the creation of this exhibition, which opened in New York and then traveled to Abu Dhabi. And um, in the course of that conversation, we'll also look at archives and installation views um, of how it looked in Abu Dhabi. Okay, and I'm on this on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Melissa. Welcome. It's such a delight to have you virtually here in Abu Dhabi with us. And I look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Maya. And also thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, as you both know, this was such a tremendous labor of love and Lynn was there for the very long, much longer <laughs> gestation. Um, than uh, I promised her, um, but she stuck by me through it all. And, um, and I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to reflect um, on the project. And I should say that I'm still reflecting on this era uh, because I've, um, one of the artists, um, uh, Jean Follette, who died in 1990, uh, is the subject of my next research project. Again, a very long, <laughs> Um, project because um, the artist left a very complicated legacy that I'm still trying to um, untangle. Um, so I'm going to begin with a very quick overview. Um, probably many of you saw the exhibit or maybe heard about it. So I thought it would be helpful to just share um, the, um, just the, you know, the basics um, of what the exhibit um, comprised. Um, so and the, the idea for inventing downtown took root in the spring of 2010 when I was teaching a course about alternative galleries. And I had wanted to learn more about the precedents to what I actually knew quite well, which were the late 1960s and 1970s artists run alternative spaces. Um, and I, um, and I thought, well, you know, I'll just do one session and I'll just figure out if anything was going on that maybe stood as a precedent, uh, uh, you know, during the 1950s. And so this one question that I had, this very overbroad question, were there any artists organized um, galleries uh, in New York in the 1950s? And I should also say New York has long been a focus of my research and writing. Um, it, it, turned into um, this incredible uh, journey. And I um, began to get very, very curious about this era. Um, and I began to visit galleries that represented artists or artist estates that had some artists who started uh, these co-op galleries, um, libraries, um, museums, archives um, be at, right at this point in the 2010s started to receive the papers of many artists. Um, and I took full advantage of a lot of new collections coming into um, the Archives of American Art and the Museum of Modern Art, particularly. Um, and my approach, um, as I started to think it through, um, became one that was equal parts social history. I was really interested in the relationships um, of the individuals involved, as well as the cultural history, which was the type of art that was being made. Um, so, um, and overall, I was interested in how these artists run galleries fit into the broader network of the 
commercial galleries uptown, um, museums, uh, particularly the Museum of Modern Art, which um, was mounting a lot of important exhibits of living American artists, um, and art magazines, collectors, etc., all of which um, were um, part of the mix. Um, and um, I situated the project between 1952 and ended it in 1965. Um, and that uh, period of 52 to 65 coincides with the height of abstract expressionism and ends with the emergence of pop and minimal art. But I was less interested in these art historical categories. I was interested in the lived experience and the institutional histories. So by taking that approach, uh, I was uh, able to expand the vanguard and um, artwork that was too long missing from our collective understanding gets returned uh, to its historical context with the values of our present day, which allows us to perhaps more openly scrutinize a new work that I believed was too long suppressed. Um, so, um, this is a map, um, whoops, sorry, of uh, uh, the um, galleries, most of which were um, on this block of East 10th Street. And I studied, you'll see this one, the Tanninger, this one, the Hansa, and then um, the Brada would be, become very important to my study. Um, but dozens of artists-run galleries opened um, in this area, which is now called the East Village, but then it was called the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, and the 14 galleries I selected as the project's focus exemplified four overarching themes. Um, one, a model that engaged in a dialogue with uptown galleries, and that would be what we're looking at here, which are the uh, co-op galleries that I'll explain in a moment. Galleries that were experimental and temporary in nature. Um, and um, the uh, emergence of uptown galleries that drew from the downtown gallery artists um, as the last um, theme. So the um, uh, very first uh, gallery that I um, included was the first co-op gallery to open as part of this 1950s opening. I should say there were other artist galleries before these, um, but this is this represents the beginning of a gallery cluster downtown. And the first one is the Tanninger Gallery, where um, um, 10 artists got together um, to um, form a co-op, which had bylaws. Uh, as well as monthly dues that would help pay the rent and other expenses. Um, and the um, members of these cooperatives, or for short co-ops, um, they uh, decided um, who would show among um, the, the membership. The Tanager was unique to all of the co-ops because they self-consciously considered themselves curators. They were um, always organizing thematic group shows in addition to shows of the members work and this nice photograph this wonderful photograph of Rudy Burkhart you know at a at one of the openings of of the Tanager um, but this photograph uh, here by John Cohen shows you two longtime members of the Tanager Angelo Ippolito and Lois Stodd working on uh, probably one of their annual, their Christmas time annual uh, exhibit where they would select anywhere from 50 to 75 artists um, to exhibit in what is now a rather small space. Um, but it is where Jasper Johns first exhibited his work. And when I spoke with him, um, he had a photograph that he wanted in the catalog, um, so I just, if we ever show the catalog at some point, Maya will we'll see because you know he demanded <laughs> that um, we um, include that that picture, which we were happy to do. Um, the second co-op gallery that opened uh, was the Hansa Gallery, and the Hansa um, had 12, 12 members. Um, probably the best known right these days is um, uh, Alan Capro, but it also had. Uh, Richard Stankiewicz, who was very well known 
became very well known in the later 50s and throughout the 70s. Um, and an artist who died tragically young, Jan Muller, uh, it also had the artist I'm studying, uh, Jean Paulette. Um, but here, these artists were, um, most of them were committed to a figuration using, you know, bringing back the figure um, in, into the work. Um, and also very interested in ex experiments around in installing their work and particularly Stankiewicz. Um, so he created these floating pedestals uh, for um, this exhibit and people, you know, just felt that uh, it, it was a kind of breakthrough in thinking about the use of the space of the gallery itself, uh, as well as looking um, at the work. Um, and then the third co-op that I decided to focus attention, my research attention on was the Brada Gallery. And what interested me the most about the Brada was its, um, interest in non-white artists. Most of the galleries were predominantly white. They were often very pretty equally um, divided between um, male and female. And in that time, people really thought of gender more in binary terms of male or female. Um, but it was pretty even. Um, not so in terms of non-white, uh, artists. So there were very, very few non-white artists um, involved in, in this time. Um, and so the Brada had Japanese American artists uh, as well as African American artists involved. And a lot of the energy of the initial group of the Brada uh, was really due to Al Held, and as I've subsequently learned with Lynn, he had a very outgoing personality and really in, very enthusiastic um, about bringing together um, different, different people that he knew. But he was also very much involved uh, uh, in um, the early civil rights movement and civil rights activism, um, especially in um, in political circles in Greenwich Village. So some of this activity also led him, led him to be befriend and become friendly with and be sympathetic to um, African-American artists. So Ed Clark was another painter who was part of this Brada collective. And it was actually Ed Clark who brought in Yayoi Kusama to the Brada uh, gallery because the two of them were, were friends. So the, um, so the next, section, and I'm thinking more in terms of the catalog than the exhibition, was the, um, what were these temporary spaces. Most often they were in um, artist studios, um, but occasionally, you know, they were spaces rented as galleries. So Red Grooms um, moved to New York from Tennessee, and uh, in his early period in New York, both of his um, loft spaces became public galleries. And the first was the City Gallery in 1958. And there are no photographs of the City Gallery, but um, I, I found in a private archive, Red wrote a letter to one of his friends where he does a diagram of where he was living, where the exhibition area was, and kind of describes um, how he turned his space into a gallery. And the artist Bob Thompson uh, drew a picture of red. Now the uh, idea of this this theme city is news. Many of the artists um, that we will look at really take New York City as subject matter, the world around them in, in New York as subject matter for their work. Um, so red definitely um, is looking very astutely at New York. Um, Capro less so, I should say, although less obviously so, although a lot, um, a lot of what he's doing is really based on his personal life and, the, and maybe some of the sounds and images he sees on the street. So Alan Capro is the catalyst behind a, a gallery called the Rubin Gallery, which probably is one of the better known spaces for adventurous art that's kind of break, you know, kind of creating a new path um, apart from abstract expressionist work. Um, here you see Capro with the artist Robert Whitman um, 
installing what's going to become his um, ha first happening, 18 happenings in six parts. And, um, and you also see on the right um, an assemblage by um, Robert Whitman, um, a piece I had desperately wanted to include in the exhibit, but Lynn pointed out that it, was, it would literally take over the whole space. Um, but um, anyway, so, um, uh, but you can see that Whitman is working with, uh, he discovered um, plastic from the dry cleaners, this new dry cleaning business <laughs> coming along, um, as well as, you know, you know, par parts um, of a door. Robert Rauschenberg at this time is also like using doors in, in his work. Um, so um, the Judson uh, Gallery was another important venue and this one was started by the pastors at the very progressive um, uh, Judson Memorial Church uh, in, uh, on Washington Square in Greenwich Village. Um, and they turned over for a year um, the gallery to Klaus Oldenburg, who um, did a three-month installation um, called The Street um, in partnership with Jim Dine, who did um, uh, uh, The House, um, and The Street was literally um, uh, Oldenburg's synthesis synthesizing, you know, the Lower East Side where he was currently living uh, and, and bringing in um, uh, different street characters uh, in, into the space. And Dines was more an internal space um, of the house. And both of, in this installation also became the setting for performances that both Dine and Oldenburg um, conducted. So the innovate, the, the, the this Oldenburg, um, in particular work was very innovative because artists saw that Oldenburg actually made his work in the gallery itself. And that was, I mean, it seems so common now that an artist will go into a gallery and just make something. And during the Dada period, perhaps that happened too in Europe, but this was really unprecedented in New York. Artists, you know, brought work from their studio to a gallery. They didn't like bring a bunch of junk like you can see that uh, Dine is doing into the gallery to construct the work. Um, Grooms um, got a second space um, the, uh, in, the, in 1959, and he called it the Delancey Street Museum. Um, and he used it as also a space to uh, innovate his own performance work, um, which was more vaudevillian um, in, in, in humor than some of the other artists. Uh, and um, Marsha Marcus, uh, a painter who's uh, undergoing a resurgence of interest. Um, and she, uh, her, her portraits are sublime, but in this case, she also um, directed uh, a happening uh, called A Garden um, in, in Grooms's space in 1960. And this is Bob Thompson, who's playing the bongos and Grooms is um, dancing. That's Marcus um, standing there. She said, she told me she was terrified um, and she could, became frozen in place. Um, the next theme is um, artists who are interested in um, kind of space and perception of space. And it was, um, but, but toward very different ends. It's also the beginning of the 60s and there is this new group of artists, many of whom are a bit younger than our other, um, other artists that we were just talking about uh, who come from San Francisco, um, drive across country to get to um, New York. One of the, those artists is Robert Morris uh, and, um, and Yoko Ono's um, loft at 112 Chambers Street becomes this very important venue for um, a year. And, um, uh, ono was friends with the composer Lamont Young. Lamont Young came from um, San Francisco and knew Robert Morris, so he uh, and they invited uh, Morris um, to do this installation, which he called Passageway. And if you walk into uh, the Passageway, which starts at the uh, door to Ono's 112 loft, you kind of and uh, in a very narrow space. And you're, you can only go as far as the shape of your body. Um, it, the thinner you are, the farther you can go, but it kind of ends in a point. Um, 
So it's, you know, it, this idea of, um, it's not quite sculptural, it's kind of an installation. There's also the sound of a metronome um, being played as you're, as you're walking through this um, space. People didn't know quite what to make of it. Um, um, the other group that also a lot of the members of this group had roots in San Francisco, including Mark DeSuvero, uh, one of the founders of the Park Place group. Um, they uh, coalesced around this building at 79 Park Place where four of the artists uh, lived um, with, within this building itself. And the top floor, which had had a fire, um, was um, uh, the landlord let them rent it if they would rehabilitate it for not that much money. And uh, anecdotally, artists shared with me that Mark DeSuvero basically paid the rent on that top floor uh, for everyone. Um, and this is the one surviving um, photograph of um, uh, one of the installations that took place uh, when they were at 79. Park Place, um, Robert Grosvenor, who is a New York artist um, and who was friendly with De Suvero, uh, and a painter, Leo Valador, who came from the Bay Area, uh, who became known later for uh, very strongly geometric work. These artists were also interested in space in terms of the way in which um, art, in, in a careful installation of art changes how you might perceive the work by put placing one thing next to another. So they were doing these long-term installations of one another's work where they would notice how things would change um, based on proximity. And they were also keenly interested in the space age uh, physics and doing work that would play off of impossible dimensions of, of 4D um, um, physics, uh, the, the idea of the three dimension bumping into yet another dimension. Um, and you see this in their later work. Um, and then the last theme um, that I explored in these temporary spaces was politics. And the 50s are not really known um, as a, an especially political time um, for, with art. Uh, in, in terms of when you're just looking at art. But in fact, the 50s and early 60s was highly political. It was the height of the civil rights movement. Uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, is passed uh, during this, this time um, under, under Johnson. Um, it's also a time of anti-censorship, uh, uh, free speech. Um, it's also the time of uh, the Cold War and, um, and some of the challenges of the Kennedy administration with um, the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis with um, um, tensions between the US and the Soviet Union uh, at an incredible height. And so the, uh, a group of artists um, led primarily by um, Boris Lurie and Sam Goodman and Stanley Fisher um, took over a co-op gallery called the March Gallery and kicked out all the other members and um, began to do a series of what we would now call agitprop shows on different themes, including nuclear annihilation or the involvement show, which was a theme around, um, you know, being, you know, um, involved in the political discourse. And this piece of Lurie's um, is um, you, you can see Lumumba's name here, but it's right after the assassination of Patrice Lumumba um, in, um, oh, I'm just forgetting where, do you remember Lynn, where Lumumba, um, the country, somebody in the chat could um, uh, share that, but he was um, assassinated. And so the, the you know, Lurie was following the um, anti-colonial movement in Africa, um, and, um, and uh, also Algeria, um, another, another area that he was tracking. Um, the Hall of Issues um, was another project that found um, a home at the Progressive uh, Judson Church. And um, this was the brainchild of Phyllis Yampolsky. Uh, and she also wanted to synthesize uh, political issues, local as international, um, with um, 
um, art, uh, although she opened it up to anyone, even a non-artist, to exhibit. So in the hall itself, you can see every week this would, uh, the, the exhibits would change, but people would bring something to exhibit. Uh, she charged 25 cents uh, for every participant. Uh, you can see the graffiti. Why isn't a thing like this free? Um, and, um, uh, and you can see people gathering at the opening and then she would organize weekly panel discussions on um, an issue. Um, and Aldo Tombolini, who participated in some projects at the Hall of Issues, as well as with the March Gallery Group, um, he started his own group called the Center. And his idea was that even those other efforts were still too internal to the art world and art people, but how do you get the community involved on the Lower East Side? So he partnered with another progressive church, the St. Mark's Church in the East Village, and um, organized outdoor exhibits that anyone could come to, any kid, anybody living uh, in the area, and also went to different churches um, to talk. Um, about um, art um, to, to reach as many people as possible. This is one of Tambellini's sculptures and that's Aldo Tambellini. And then the final group in this section was the spiral group, which were formed um, as a um, discussion group, um, trying to determine to how they might respond to the 1963 March on Washington. This is where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his uh, uh, well-known speech, I have a dream um, as a, a way of ending Jim Crow segregation in the South. Um, so the artists got together. This was interesting because it was two generations of artists, an older generation that emerged in the 1930s uh, alongside younger artists who were in their 20s um, in, in the early 60s, including uh, artist Emma Amos. Um, and they could never agree on a strategy, uh, but they did ultimately do one exhibition that they called Spiral Works um, in Black and White in 1965. Um, and then soon thereafter, the group disbanded. But it was a very important and catalytic group for getting um, African-American artists to figure out together um, you know, how their work might or might not uh, engage um, directly uh, with the civil rights um, uh, movement. And this is the one photograph I've ever found um, of the exhibit, and it was taken by Paul Jurgens, the son of Max Jurgens, and you're looking at Max Jurgens's abstract uh, paintings that were made specifically for the exhibition. And then the last section of the show, which when we did it at the gray, we had it on the lower level, um, of uh, the gray has two floors and a lower level. And um, as a way of kind of looking more closely at this transition from downtown to uptown. Um, so the dealer, Richard Bellamy, whose papers became available uh, to me uh, in 2010 when MoMA acquired them. And um, um, I went for a whole summer <laughs> uh, reading through um, nearly all of them. Um, but um, I, I found Bellamy to be a very fascinating person. He was utterly ambivalent about making money, um, um, but he was given this opportunity because he had a commercial patron, um, the collector Robert Skull, who was paying the rent for this space. And so he started making these astute decisions about artists he felt um, were doing really important work. Uh, so um, this is a 1962 group show that you can see on the left. Um, you have Robert Morris's another plane, you know, he's dealing with these geometric shapes. Um, uh, the painter Richard Smith, uh, who was British, but was spending a year on a fellowship in New York and um, really um, loving the advertisements of New of New York billboards. And so some of these shapes, you know, he's finding logos or billboards. Um, you see a Kusama accumulation chair, um, the um, uh, Wolford, um, one of the, an abstract painter, and then uh, in, in Oldenburg. So you can kind of see that Bellamy's not interested 
in minimal, oh, this should be min with minimal, or this should be pop. Like he's not thinking that way. He's like putting together artists that he's interested in and he's not thinking in terms of these divisions. Um, and we have this great installation view, Bellamy and Oldenburg, uh, and an assistant we haven't been able to identify, and, and Pat, uh, Mu Patty Muha, who was married to Oldenburg at that time, working on how to install the show. And Oldenburg built everything, mostly not except the plaster pieces, but all the soft sculptures he literally constructed in this, in this space. And, um, and Oldenburg shared with me um, all the color slides over two, 250 color slides of um, taken by Robert McElroy um, who visited Oldenburg a couple of days a week through for the month of August watching him and Patty make everything um, and so Lynn and I were able to show my husband and I organized into a film all the slides with Oldenburg's approval into a movie um, that shows like the, you know, make it, you know, how it all came together. And we were able to show that um, uh, in the exhibit. Oh, and also in the end, I thought it was interesting. A lot of these pedestals disappear. Oldenburg ends up putting everything directly on the floor, which, um, but the uh, a very important point here is that Bellamy um, was answerable to his patron, Robert Skull and Robert Skull, um, really prefer the artists who were kind of on the cutting edge. So women, um, while women were part of the program at the very beginning, women really get dropped. By 1963, um, you really only have one female artist um, showing, uh, uh, and that is Lee Lozano. But apart from Lee Lozano, all the other women that um, uh, Bellamy had been showing are not invited back to do another show. And this is also the perils of Uptown, um, if you're a woman. So in closing, um, I would just say that the, I had no idea what this show would look like, because for me, researching it, you know, I'm running, spending, you know, how many years just running around seeing everything separately. And, um, and so, for me, the, the exhibition was, I should also say, a revelation for me as well, the installation, um, which we'll, Lynn will talk about, which did not follow this, this particular format of the book, um, because I had not seen the work all put together at all. Uh, I mean, I saw installation views, but, you know, but, but seeing the work in color um, is something different. And, and by bringing back what one critic called the messiness of the era, by having the categories that we've come to rely upon utterly dismantled in favor of a kind of institutional look, you could use that framework to bring back people who, um, women and non-white artists, uh, whose work in that time period would not find um, commercial viability. And so our values right now are different. Um, I'm not saying they're perfect, but they're different. And we can take a look at that work for what it was and make our own estimation as to whether that work um, belongs and make, make a different case. So we'll Thank you. lend here. <laughs> amazing. Thank you so much. It was great to sort of walk through um, the images without you know, so I came to this exhibition through the actual installation of it, right? So my process was the exact opposite from you. <laughs> the exhibition arrived fully formed as if, you know, from hand, handed down from Lynn. And uh, so I'd love to hear, um, I, there are two things I want to do in the time that we have left. One is to um, take a look at how that exhibition looked when it arrived in Abu Dhabi, but also to hear from Lynn, um, in, about your process with relation to this and stories that you feel that our audiences should hear who might not have known what went on in the process of the making of this exhibition. And would you like me to, to open up the screen and show install views while you talk or, or sure, what? It's absolutely fine. I think to do two at the same time is good. And I should just say that um, I am seated virtually in the installation. I see. Um, <laughs> at the Gray Art Gallery when it existed, but I was thrilled to come and see it also um, in Abu Dhabi. And every time 
in exhibition travels, you get a totally different view. There are different dialogues and conversations that go among the works themselves. And um, the space in Abu Dhabi, the gallery is so beautiful. It really, I feel, welcomes the work. And Maya and her team did an amazing job um, of, so of moving um, the installation. And, you know, um, as Melissa said, um, you have more space than we do. So it had a little <laughs> bit more air, um, which allowed us to appreciate some of the works a little better. Um, and about Melissa's point, you know, I feel like in a way that's true, but it also in your space, it felt more kind of authentic, right? Like the, when you see the images of those installations, they were much tighter in terms of how they were installed than what we ended up doing. Yeah, so there's, do this. there's different, different ways of looking at it. I mean, different, right. different works, um, you know, jumped out um, and different works um, sang in a different way. So it, it, for me, the most interesting thing were the different conversations. And um, I think for me too, one of the things that I enjoyed um, very much in terms of um, working um, with Melissa on the um, show as it evolved was the fact that um, I always find it intriguing when artists take matters into their own hands and said, okay, we just don't have enough opportunities to show the commercial galleries. We're not showing at the early fifties, a lot of the contemporary um, artists. And so they, in a sense, um, went and took matters into their own hands and said, okay, we're going to create these cooperative galleries. Um, and, you know, we always like at the gray and Melissa agrees to show a lot of the ephemera. And so one of the most intriguing documents I think that we showed was the um, bylaws um, for the Tanager gallery about whose role was what and who, you know, had to sit at the gallery and who had to, you know, um, make these decisions. And so it was really fun to see behind the scenes as it were and understand how these otters operated and it was what one of the things that was striking to me about it is the the could you walk me through or walk us through um what is the difference in motivation between when an artist puts together a cooperative gallery and when a gallerist opens a gallery is it do you think that they viewed this as auditioning for the uptown galleries or were they thinking of themselves as sort of in opposition to the establishment? Was there a sense of an establishment and the anti-establishment? I mean, this is fairly early, right? Yeah, I'm going to turn this over to Melissa because okay. she had a really wonderful anecdote when one of the artists um, came to talk just about how tough it was to break into the old boys club. Melissa? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, the, the, an, None, none of the galleries in this period were oppositional to uh, Uptown, far from it. Um, I mean, maybe they thought it was boring or conservative, but um, but they they saw it as part. They saw themselves as wanting to be part of this system. So if there's, you know, so the art art was this field. There was this system. Um, they uh, the the. The, many of them knew artists like uh, Franz Klein or Bill de Kooning, who did not even have an uptown show until they were in their 40s. These were people in their 20s and 30s, so they didn't think, they thought, oh, well, they'll have to work another decade. So they weren't, they, they had, they, they didn't think that, that, that uptown was an option when it took this other generation right before them so long to have that option. So it wasn't oppositional that way. It was simply a factor of um, a depression in real estate prices in New York, a kind of hangover from the era of the Great Depression, where the spaces downtown were rather inexpensive. It was actually feasible. So in the case of the Tanager members, 10 members only had to pay $10 a month, which I mean, wasn't nothing, but it wasn't onerous uh, to pay that. The, the Hansa group tended to um, 
to pay, pay more for whatever reason. And the Brada group paid even less because um, the uh, uh, Krushnik brothers who um, got secured the space were also operating a frame shop in the back. So that helped pay um, the expenses there. But they weren't, um, um, but they weren't oppositional to Uptown. Ultimately, they all wanted to show. Um, they wanted to show, they would love to show Costelli or, you know, Sidney Janet yeah, yeah. or Martha Jackson. You know, these are, these are people they wanted to uh, attract attention to. And so they were, oops, I'm, I think I'm getting feedback, sorry. Um, Did you have a question, Maya? Yeah, um, Melissa, it's, okay, you can hear me okay? Yeah, I guess what I'm, what I'm also wondering is, you know, in the context of the exhibitions that the Gray has, has been doing around this period as well, um, Lynn, for you, when you look at sort of the development of the New York art scene, from where we stand now, it feels monolithic, right? There's just this incredible power between an artist from New York is like, okay, you're real, you're a real artist, right? In 1950s, my understanding was that this was not so much the case. Is there a sense, you know, I know that there were some other, there was other shows around this period that you've worked on, Lynn. Do you have a sense of there being a moment? Um, and, and what, accounts for the moment where somehow things become legitimate in the eyes of critics, sure. or artists or collectors or museums, you know, what's so the it, I think, you know, an important precedence um, for both me and Melissa was New York Cool, which was a show that was drawn from our collection. And the NYU art collection was started in 1958. And we have a lot of works by the artists living and working in New York. And um, I think this happens um, whenever you go into depth in any one scene. There's never just one thing happening. Artists, there are always going to be artists who paint figuratively. There are always going to be artists who paint abstractly. There are going to be also artists who find different ways of assemblage or sculpture or whatever. So you're always going, and, and, and it's a very diverse scene. Um, what gets legit, legitimatized and what gets um, canonized and what is saleable is another story. So you have these parallel stories going on. And what Melissa wanted to do was look at the origins of these and dismantle those broad groupings because, and I think this is from what I understand, Maya, and your work you know, in the UAE in terms of its emerging art scene and trying to document it, is that artists themselves kind of are who you go to to find out what's really happening. Um, you ask them and ask who they're looking at and, you know, what, what is of interest to them. And then you talk to, you know, to discern kind of these larger things. I, artists don't think um, in art historical terms um, necessarily. And one of the things you can see in each of the groupings that Melissa, you know, ended up using as an organizing principle for the exhibition is that there's a wide diversity of styles when e within each of these groupings. So some tended a little bit more towards figuration, maybe some tended more towards abstraction. I think what happens, you know, with the experimental phase, and this is when some of the artists started saying, well, hey, we don't need to show up town after all. In the second half of the show is that, you know, with Judson Church, they say, we're never going to sell this stuff. Let's just do it. And they become their own audience. And then it's this wonderful circuit back, as Melissa mentioned, when Green Street starts to tap some of these artists and bring them uptown. So those are the larger shifts you can see. So, you know, and also at NYU, um, and uh, it's great that, you know, we share this among the global campuses. There's this amazing downtown collection that is housed at Fales Library. And Marvin Taylor, who was the founding director of the Fales Library, uh, the Fales Downtown Collection, um, started amassing um, a lot of documents by writers, poets, artists, performers. And his view when he, he got to NYU um, some 25 years ago was to say, it's really important for NYU to document what is the scene where we are located in which it, in terms of NYU, New York is Greenwich Village. And I think, again, what, what is really gratifying to see um, at NYU Abu Dhabi is that Maya's you know, taken a similar approach to say it's really important that we look at what's happening around us, where we are, 
and then open it up for discussions and so forth. But um, it makes so much sense. And so we've done a series of downtown shows um, and you know, Inventing Downtown serves as a kind of prequel to that. And I do want to actually just show the book, um, which- I was just about to ask you to hold it up, but your screen, uh, I think your background- yeah, It's gonna be hard, but here you can see it. Okay. Um, and there's a wonderful picture of Red Grooms bringing up a, um, a painting in a baby carriage on Third Avenue, or Fourth Avenue, I think it is. Um, and I see that Laura Lindgren, who's the amazing designer, is sitting in on this webinar, and I want to thank her again for doing such a spectacular design. But the book itself um, functions um, pretty well to give you a sense. Um, and you know, you can do things in a book that you can't do in a show, like include really, really images of very large works uh, if you have limited space. So, I mean, I think that dialogue was really important. The fact that we included a lot of other, you know, again, the ephemera um, made it for a richer show. And I think you've been doing that as well, Maya, in, in terms of presentations at the art yeah. gallery. Yeah, the, um, I thank you for bringing that up because, so we brought this exhibition to Abu Dhabi in, um, in the fall and it, immediate, it was immediately following an exhibition in which we had presented um, the history of one of the, and, and again, it's not monolithic, but a strand of the art scene in the UAE. So it's, there's this kind of avant-garde that functioned very much like a um, like a counterculture underground, um, but not necessarily by choice. Again, they're sort of banding together to create the community that allows the innovation to develop, which I think is one of the most, um, I love, I love this. One of the things that I love so much about this exhibition Inventing Downtown is that it really kind of shows us how innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It happens in this messy collaborative environment of artists, both supporting and competing with each other in a way that generates productive exchange and tension, which I think you see coming out of their support of each other, but also their questioning and challenging of each other's work. And that's something that was happening in the UAE and, and uh, has been clearly documented um, back into the 70s at least um, and became very intense in the 90s um, and and I was and I did a series of artist interviews it wasn't me it was me and a, a team um, so a, a lot Adris and Bana Katan were key collaborators on this and helping sort of trace this history that people who are here know pieces of the stories but almost nobody had um, who, who hadn't been through it knew this knew the kind of overarching shape of the story of this kind of self-made art scene that was not you know it was not decreed or planned just sort of emerged around key kind of magnetic figures who then created exhibitions together um, and so it was really an amazing uh, resonance between our spring exhibition called but we cannot see them and our fall exhibition inventing downtown and i think even now you know we are very actively involved in conversations about what is artistic community and what is an ecosystem and and how do we allow basically give that room to grow and give it the nourishment that it needs and for nyu as an institution you know we're launching an mfa program um, which will be the first mfa in the country and um and that's a you know that right there is a piece that we can offer back to where we are but it's kind of this for me i really looked i really took a lot from the inventing downtown exhibition in terms of how to think about what um, art history can look like when you don't center it around the artistic genius, right? Or like the key movement or the key formal development, but instead you look at, at how innovation and ideas emerge, which I think is a really a fantastic um, approach to thinking about art history that I really, really value in the work that you guys are doing. So thank you. Yeah, and I will um, also say that Lynn yeah. um, exhibition, uh, the downtown show, which was like the pre the my show was like the prequel, <laughs> although it came yeah. out um, did a similar thing um, about the um, 70s and 80s uh, downtown scene that was really celebrated a lot of what Marvin Taylor uh, brilliantly um, innovated at the Fales Library, which up until Marvin Taylor got there was really known for its Victorian literature and I think cookbook collection. I mean, oh, wow. 
Yeah, cook Actually, Marvin started the cookbook collection as oh, well. Oh, he did too? Okay. <laughs> around, around NYU's very important food studies department. So NYU has one yes. of the best food studies departments um, in the country. And so he started collecting materials. But no, it's, it's great. And the, the synergy and the messiness is really important. Um, and um, it's been really fun to see after the exhibition, um, after inventing downtown, to see some artists like Marsha Marcus and Mimi Grooms and others. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, gross. Uh, thank you. Um, get the attention they deserve. Um, yes. And, you know, They're it's- overdue, you know, the, um, I, I should also say, so many of these artists, and you, you see this in the field of literature also, you know, somebody will reissue a novel you know, that's been out of print, and then 10 years later, reissue the same novel. And, and so I feel that some artists like Marsha Marcus or Mimi Gross um, and, and some of the others would have once a decade the exhibition that everyone would say, oh, they're so important, they're so, they're so marvelous. And then, no, you know, there was, no, there was no way it kind of fit into a changing understanding of the categories because the categories still seem so um, fundamental to uh, how one thinks. And even, even with postmodernism, um, it seems that, you know, the, you know that, that even within postmodern literature, you know, people spend considerable time and effort like reflecting on, you know, critics like Clement Greenberg, um, you know, to like fight that battle. Um, and I, I feel that when Lynn and the Gray, you know, and, and university galleries, you know, in general, but what, what Maya, what you and Lynn are doing is you're saying, you know, let's, you know, let's think about the work. Let's start with the work or let's start with what artists had to say, you know, the, my discussions with Lynn were so different uh, during the gestation from my discussions with some um, historians or academics who, um, who really don't follow artist testimony with the same level of seriousness that they might follow a kind of more intellectual debate among a critic or a theorist. And, and I would, I would, but I would say it's, 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 it's just a different set of questions even, right? Like the seriousness yeah. or not, it's just a different set of questions that leads to a different way of telling the story. Sorry to cut in. No, no, it, it, absolutely. And so the concerns, my, my concerns have, just because I worked as a curator, my concerns are always attached to the material, you know, the object. And the object actually matters and how it was made and um, what, what was happening in that artist's life, which does not necessarily explain, you know, all you can take from it because um, viewing art is such a subjective experience and, um, and, and one brings what one brings to, you know, the viewing. Uh, experience, but I do not, I, I feel that those elements, um, I mean, that's why I liked art, um, because I loved the, the material, the object, you know, I loved scrutinizing it. It's endlessly rewarding to puzzle out what someone's made. Um, and in doing this project, you know, what was so ex extraordinary was also going to so many different studios. Um, I, I would also say that the work that was championed that, you know, that got selected back in the 50s and 60s as, you know, significant, um, I don't think, and I wasn't interested particularly in dismantling the importance, you know, um, of the artists whose reputation um, was made, you know, quite early on um, in that period. What I believe is that you, you know, you can now understand perhaps a bit better what someone like Oldenburg was looking at, you know, so it doesn't make Oldenburg any less of an artist. In fact, I feel it, you know, it, it places him back into this context where you can see what he was doing, um, but also what he was maybe borrowing um, um, along the way from others. Um, or in the case of um, an artist like Lucas Samaras, who um, actually got better known later in the 1970s, but there's this incredible 
um, dialogue between an artist like Lucas Samaras and an artist like Martha Edelheit, who's another artist in our show, that was looking at these kinds of states of being and these kind of states of intensity and sexual tension. And they're both playing off of um, issues of the body and tension, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I, I just, you start to see these conversations that you would never notice um, right. if you just were looking at Adel Height or just looking at someone like Samara. Exactly, exactly. It's a, it, I, I, to, I completely agree with you that you, looking at the people around, the ones that are all, already well known changes how we understand them, but also sheds light on other talent that we may have, that may have been overlooked for reasons of prejudice at the time, for example. I'm conscious of our time. Um, I think that this has been so engaging. I'm, I'm, I'm realizing how quickly the hour is gone. And, I, and we have a number of questions from the audience that I think it would be really nice if we could get to. Um, there, and I'm gonna read through them and, and kind of put them all out at once and then see what we can do with them. One is, um, a very specific one, were Yoya Kusama and Yoko Ono the only Asian artists selected and recognized during the period of downtown artist-run galleries, which is a sort of an interesting question. I think in general, um, sort of how rare was it for a non-European diaspora artist to be shown uh, or to be part of these collectives? Another was, will you be speaking about what the New York art scene is like now and how you believe the pandemic will affect it? Um, I also want to give a shout out to the downtown collection, which is at um, guides.nyu.edu slash downtown dash collection. Check it out. Um, was there any, were there any textile artists working at this time and where did they, if they did show? Um, and there was a question also about whether I would be curating exhibitions, more exhibitions along these lines. So, but we cannot see them was an exhibition that I curated that um, covered the avant-garde in the UAE from 1988 to 2008. And then there was one recently, which was of emerging US UAE based artist called Speculative Landscapes. And there's one coming up that will be announced soon that will be go even bigger. Very exciting. So that's my answer. You guys get to answer the, the other ones. New York Today, textile artists, non-white artists in general or specifically Asian. Um, um, the one artist that jumps right to my mind is Ko um, uh, Kobayashi. Oh, Robert Kobayashi, yes. Yes. Um, so his work was in, and his wife, whose name I'm forgetting for the uh, moment. Nani Momiyama. Yeah, so there were two other Asian artists. Um, and um, uh, Leo Valador was Filipino-American, if I remember correctly. Tadaki, Melissa, any others? Yeah, Tadaki Kuyama. Oh, right. Was uh, an incredibly um, successful artist. In fact, he just started uptown. He didn't, I don't think he uh, exhibited downtown. But at this time, there were other um, Asian artists, Asian American artists. I should say there, there were different programs, some of which were funded by the Rockefeller family that had um, uh, stipends for and fellowships for Japanese um, um, a Japanese exchange, Japanese-American Japanese exchange, I mean, in the aftermath of the nuclear holocaust, um, this was part, um, uh, part, part of a, a kind of an American reparation process um, to bring artists, um, Japanese, artists of Japanese descent to, um, to America. And New York, of course, um, you know, became um, a place for a lot of the visual artists. Um, so, and then there was, and then the other, the other was textile artists. Sure. So I'm not as well versed, um, and I think at that time textile um, was pretty much separated into uh, uh, and and it was like the high level into yeah. craft, um, yeah. which was not seen as important. But there certainly were a number of artists working with textiles um, that were active at the time. Um, none of them, I don't think, were um, necessarily part of these cooperative galleries, but I know that, you know, that there were some really um, important artists. Leonor uh, Tani comes to mind, um, and, you know, th there were movements in Europe as well with Magdalena Abakanovich and others. Um, Melissa, are you better informed on this than I am? Well, not so much with textiles, much to my regret, um, but there were um, 
yes, there were divisions. I mean, even photography was, had, there was a separate co-op gallery for photography in New York called the Light Gallery, I think. Um, photography was not considered high art. Yeah. No. So the, um, the craft arts, which were vitally important, uh, in, uh, and especially in the 1930s, there was like way more of a, uh, I think, a support system um, for craft. Um, uh, but in New York City, I must say in New York City, New York City is not the best venue for the craft arts. Uh, you, you find that there's far more support in other regions of, of the United States, um, you, you know, um, and I, I don't know why this, I will say that at Black Mountain College, um, Annie Albers was teaching there and she, uh, you know, is a renowned textile artist and was incredibly influential to a lot of artists, many of whom came to New York. Um, and I do, I do think there's a lot more interest now in looking at these artists who were, you know, exploring um, textiles as a way in which to make art. And what's, you know, what, what's ironic and I think important to note is, you know, with Klaus Oldenburg and his soft sculptures, mm -hmm. it was Patty Musha, his, his wife at the time, who was um, making those, um, sewing those. Yes. Um, sculptures working alongside her husband at the time. But, you know, and this attention with the women's movement and feminism also, you get a lot more attention to craft and, you know, this. I should just, I should just chime in here that I, we're getting a lot of responses in the chat about this. And I think that the question was, um, I think we're thinking specifically in the 1950s, right? And that this is, there was a clear explosion of the incredible craft movement, especially with the rise of, of feminist kind of awakening that changed how we understood fiber arts, right? Right, almost immediately after this moment, it starts to emerge um, as a trend. So I don't know, if, for, for those of you responding in the chat, it would be great if you have, if you wanna chime in on people who were showing in the 50s on textiles, right? Um, and then, and, uh, and it, this is one of my pet subjects as well. So I'm excited to, to always to learn more. Um, and then in terms of, of New York today, there are a couple of questions. One was about, you know, is there an art scene now, which is kind of an interesting question on multiple levels, right? Because the pandemic gentrification, the, the, you know, the split between those who have and those who have not, and we all know that you need a roof over your head and food as a baseline before you can make very much art. Um, and so, so in New York now, how is it feeling in terms of the art scene? And I can talk about Abu Dhabi, but I, I would love to hear how it's feeling there. Um, well, I'll start off with, you know, there's been a number of ex, you know, exhibition spaces moving out to the boroughs um, and moving up to Harlem as, you know, people just couldn't pay the rents in Manhattan. But what's interesting also is there's a resurgence of artists moving back into literally the Lower East Side um, and to storefront galleries. I think what's now is complicated is that um, with, and this, there was just an article I saw in one of the social media posts, maybe in Artnet news that um, there's also a consolidation of the mega galleries, um, yeah. you know, which are um, taking over. Um, and so one is really concerned that the smaller galleries um, with that can maintain a lower overhead stay alive. Um, galleries are only starting to open up in New York on appointment only basis. So we'll see what happens. Um, and we'll see who manages. There's a, a, um, a um, ban against evictions right now. So there's been a question posed about, you know, if galleries haven't been able to make the rents, what will happen when things, you know, uh, reopen. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but certainly there is an active art scene. There are artists, um, are hardy creatures, usually they have to be. Um, and, you know, I have a number of friends who are working and, you know, doing their best, um, and, and we'll see. M Melissa, your thoughts? I agree. We, we will see. There was, it's not an art, I, there was an amazing article, and Maya, I'll, I'll send you the link, and if you want to send it to the attendees, um, a restaurateur who ran a small restaurant in the East Village called Prune, I don't know if you read this, um, um, but she wrote probably the, and I'm going to assign it to my students, but I think she wrote probably the best. Article. Yeah, oh, yes, if I can, you know, 
Um, but it was in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Times, yes, in the Sunday Magazine, not long after the, during the lockdown really, um, where she really reflects on what the city's become and that it was not sustainable. Um, it should not be sustained. We should not emerge from this crisis with um, the kind of catering to such an elite, uh, you know, um, uh, an elite clientele that's not about community, but kind of about a sort of stat, like the seeking of status. Like I can check this, I, w I went to this restaurant, I got a reservation, I can check this off my list. Um, so she um, talks about, you know, reinventing what a restaurant could be. And like Lynn says, I, um, as long as there's artists, I believe that, um, that the world, you know, it doesn't, the artists hold the keys to the future. We don't know what they're going to invent. Um, we don't know what their art will lead us to reinvent because for, you know, when I showed the work of um, Oldenburg uh, as well as Stankiewicz and, um, you know, kind of building environments to, in which to situate their art, something that had been done in Europe but really had not been done in the U.S. Um, at that time, that, that was so catalytic, you know, and now we just take that as a normal thing. Um, but it wasn't a normal thing. Um, and so whatever we thought was normal then could be absent pre-COVID, whatever we thought was normal and every day and routine and just this system we're born into and it's probably going to continue forever. Well, I think that we're seeing right now that, that things are far less certain. And so um, it's kind of on all of us um, to decide um, what to get behind. And, you know, and I'm definitely gonna get behind these new models that really promote dialogue, diversity, um, and um, I innovation. So, um, so, oh, and I think that we, uh, Laura uh, just posted for everyone <laughs> the New York Times article. So, um, um, so, some other people did as well. I think, I think that article must have struck such a nerve for so many of us. It really captured so much of the deeper questioning that we're doing in this time about why, what, and how we're, we're proceeding with what we do. Yes, yeah. and, so, and so, yeah, I, I do believe that, um, um, that art will continue because it always has no matter what. Um, um, but I also believe that there are, as Lynn pointed out, these deep inequities that are built into our system that are, you know, being litigated right now, you know, in, in the United States, um, but um, increasingly, you know, all over the world. And um, yeah, and I, I, this is this is true in, you know, I think in the questions about um, and why this question of how an artist is legitimized um, is such a pressing question today um, on every front, whether we're talking about international artists working from in whatever part of the world or whether we're just talking about any in any given town, which artist is going to show in that town's gallery or get reviewed by that town's art critic or, you know, um, and who's the arbiter of this and why do we keep making art that does or doesn't get shown. Um, okay, so I want to I want to wrap it up. Um, I think ending with artists hold the key to the future. Is that what she says? It was a beautiful little phrase. I was like, oh, that's it. That's our closing front sentence right there. You're welcome to add one more if you want. No, I think that's a good one. I mean, you know, there was something else that, you know, I think um, one of the critics just going, uh, writing in the Times again, you know, going back, we're all starved to see real art. And I feel, I really feel, um, you know, that need. Um, it's what sustains us. It's what gives yeah. us nourishment. You know, it's what makes it worthwhile. So we look to the artists to, for inspiration and um, thank them for continuing to do what they do. I, I agree. I agree. And thank you guys for the work that you're doing and, and for being on this journey with us. Um, thank you all. I want to also give a special shout out to Sebastian Gruba and Sonali Shirodkar who are behind the scenes and visibly producing this event and to the teams at the Gray Art Gallery and at the NYUW Art Gallery, both of whom helped get the word out. And it's been a great turnout and a really good conversation. Yeah, it was fun to see some friends. I'm really glad this turned out. Yeah, really enjoyable. I'll talk to you all later and we'll sign off.
Good night. Thank you. Thank you.